Welcome to Sunday School class. We are starting a new quarterly. Uh, this one, uh, Some Fundamental Doctrines, Part 2. So really it's a continuation of the train of thought that we were looking at uh, in our last quarter. Um, there we looked at the creation, uh, God as the creator, the creation of man, we looked at the fall of man into sin, and then we looked at God's provision, God's way of salvation. Now we're picking up from that point on because salvation automatically brings into existence the church. So our next uh, several le lessons, uh, next four lessons, is talking about the church. And today, lesson one, we are looking at the church is likened to a building, and particularly its establishment. Now, when we say that the church is like a building, we're not talking so much uh, a roof and walls and windows and uh, things that we think about a building, but we're talking about like building a building. There's a process. Uh, when a building needs to be built, there has to be ground that the building is going to be built on. Then they usually come in and do some excavating and leveling out the uh, ground and digging a foundation and then building uh, in that way. And that's, that's kind of the concept uh, when we're talking about uh, the church likened to a building is uh, how, how did Jesus go about starting his church. Our uh, memory verse is 2 Timothy, uh, verse 2, verse 19. This is a very good verse for us to remember. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So, uh, we have a foundation in, the, in the, uh, the church, of the church. And I like, it says here that the foundation stands sure. In other words, it's firm. It's not going anywhere. Unlike the foundation of this building, which is kind of wobbly, uh, as you can see by the cracks in the walls and things of that nature, uh, this is only a literal building. We call it a church, a church building. Actually, this is not the church. The church is the saved people that come here to worship God and um, study the Word of God. But the foundation that God laid for the church that He built is sure. And that has a seal to it, something that holds it in place. And that is the very fact that uh, God knows who are his. Uh, I'm so glad for that. Uh, I don't have to decide who belongs to God and who doesn't. God does that. And, you know, sometimes we can be fairly sure that this person, that person uh, really knows God. Uh, sometimes we can... Be sure that, you know, this person, that person doesn't, does not really know God. How? Well, by the evidence of their lives, their behavior, what they're uh, about. But still, it's not our place to say who is really a child of God or not. We accept people on their testimony and uh, go from there. But God knows. Uh, so... It's not my place to admit people into the church or to put them out. That's God's job. I'm glad for that. My job as the minister is just to, to teach, uh, to give some uh, administrative guidance uh, for the business, to counsel, uh, and, and encourage people when they need things like that. So, um, at the bottom of page 2, uh, there's a point there said, God has provided the means for freeing each individual person from sin and making him godly. 
that's kind of where we ended up last quarter, talking about the means of salvation. How did God make it possible? And then how does God through salvation make it possible for us to, to live a godly life? Well, from there we go on to what the next sentence says. It says, he also has set up a plan for gathering those individuals together into a united group, a holy organism, the church. The church has a purpose according to God. It's just not something that people just thought up. It's God's plan. And God's plan for the church is to help people to come to that saving knowledge of God that we talked about in last quarter, but also to ground them, to teach them, and to instruct them, to encourage them uh, in living for God. And that's something that we need continually in our lives. Uh, I was saved at the age of 14 back in 1961. Um, I tell you what, I have needed a lot of instruction, a lot of spiritual help in those however many years that's been since 1961. Uh, I thank God for the church, and I thank God for ministers that God placed uh, in the church that taught me and instructed me and encouraged me, and for other people of God that have been very good example to me in how to live for God. Uh, some people, uh, older men uh, in the congregation, I think of Brother Buddy Owens back there in, in Morgan City, Alabama, a uh, devoted man of God. He worked in uh, a mill in Huntsville. That was his lifelong career, working in a mill, worked with his hands. Uh, but I tell you, when uh, he would teach Sunday school and he taught out of the Bible paths quarterly. Uh, it wasn't just a man talking. It was a man who knew God and a man who had experienced God in his life. God that helped him to be faithful even at that mill. And a mill can be a pretty rugged place to work. Okay? Not just physically, but sometimes uh, uh, people go work in places like that that they can't work other places. Some have bad attitudes, and, uh, just sometimes try to make things as hard on people as, as I can. But he was a witness for God there, and his life was a shining example of what it means to be a Christian man. And I thank God for that, because it uh, really gave me some encouragement. And there were some times in my life where I was... Um, involved in some struggles of things that come against me that I had no control over. And when he knew about those things, he always had an encouraging word uh, that would lift me up and give me some hope. So the church is the people, and we need each other um, to encourage and to, uh, instruct us and to, to be the examples. Uh, young people... Uh, look around for older people that have known God for a long time and look at their example and uh, let God show you what it means to be a Christian, okay? Uh, our first verse in talking about the establishing the church is Matthew 16, 18. Uh, this is a very well-known verse. Uh, especially in the Church of God fellowship. We, we like to, to teach a lot on the church, uh, but we're not talking about a movement. We're not talking about fellowships or even just uh, congregations. We're talking about what Jesus said here. And Jesus says, And I say also unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Okay, so here we have the first words of Jesus concerning the church. 
Now, if you will read all four Gospels over and over again, you don't see Jesus using the word church very often. This is one of the very few times that he uses the word church. And he uses it to introduce the concept of the church. Now, quite frequently, before he brings up the church, he talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Those are the same thing, just different words, okay? Um, people often equate the kingdom of God and the church as being the same thing. And in reality, they are not totally the same. There's definitely an overlap. But the kingdom of God is that which God produces and brings people into through salvation, and so is the church. But the church is different from the kingdom in that the church exists to do the work of the kingdom. Our job as the church is to teach the kingdom of God, teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay, so that people can be brought into the kingdom of God. So Jesus promised a church. I will build my church, okay? And he said about this church that the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not prevail against his church. Uh, we have done some studying of church history as we've looked through the book of Revelation. Is the history of the church beautiful and glorious all the way through? Anybody? <laughs> now, there's some pretty discouraging times. In fact, there's a lot of discouraging times. But still, Jesus has a church. Even in the midst of all the apostasy of, of history, of uh, mankind devising their idea of the church here and church there, coming up with denominations and groups and movements and things of that nature. All those things are not the church. They call themselves the church. Uh, and uh, they don't even come anywhere close to being the church in that thought. But there's always been a church in that God has always been saving people. Okay? The gospel has never stopped being preached to people. And people have never stopped coming to the gospel. That's been going on for 2,000 years. So in that sense, even though there's been apostasy, there's been a diversions from what God planned, Jesus has always had his church in the context of saved people. And during that time, there have been times when saved people have gathered together and formed and been in congregations and been the church in a visible sense as well. So the church, as Jesus planned it, is always victorious in spite of what people do around it and in the name of the church. So Jesus said, I will build my church. Did he? Well, the answer is yes. And does that church that Jesus built still exist today? And the answer is yes. Okay. Well, which one is it? Is it the Presbyterians? Is it the Methodists? Is it the, uh, you name it. Well, look around and find where God's church really is, where church, Jesus' church really is. The church has been promised. It, it was built and it's here. Okay. Next, we look at Luke 16, verse 16, uh, that says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. Here, Jesus is telling the religious world that there is a change of dispensation. Uh, in time that began with the coming of John the Baptist. Okay, what is this change of dispensation? The kingdom of God is come. That's what John taught. 
Um, with this, we have the beginning of the concept of the church. You don't actually have the church with the preaching of John, but you do have the introduction of the kingdom. Okay, so um, we're changing from the law of Moses under Judaism, the law of sacrifices, and the various rituals of the temple to something that is for all people. You see, the law of Moses, the temple worship and all that were for the kingdom of Israel. That was God's kingdom in a temporal sense under the Old Testament. But John came preaching the kingdom of God, where now all people, regardless whether they're Jews or Gentiles, can have a relationship with God. So, uh, beginning with the preaching of John, the Bible says that every man presses into the kingdom. People were given the opportunity to hear the gospel with the beginning of John's preaching. Okay, Remember, John said uh, when he was baptizing, look, uh, one greater than I is coming. And he's going to do more than baptize you with water. He says he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's going to be a spiritual and moral change that you've never been able to experience under the law of Moses. And that's the kingdom of God. That spiritual and moral change takes place in your life. Uh, you notice our author does say, while well, the terms kingdom and church may indicate something different, uh, they still overlap in what they do. Okay? Um, uh, makes the point here, John did not build the church. It is therefore not John the Baptist church. John the Baptist merely introduced us to the one who would be king of the kingdom and the founder and builder of the church. So that was John's job, introducing the kingdom, introducing Messiah, and also uh, laying the foundation for the building of the church. Okay? Um, if you took a look at um, page five under, <clears throat> under points to consider. A statement there, a divine church, referring to Matthew 16, 18. During his earthly ministry, Jesus had little to say directly about the church, but here states emphatically he will build a church, his church. He speaks of but one church and claims ownership of that church. He says, my church. Three outstanding truths we need to get are, number one, first of all, that it is Jesus who built the church. All right? Therefore, it is divine in that sense. The church is not something dreamed up by just everyday people. And it's not something that is built and organized by everyday people. Now, we are everyday people. We, we have a church building. Uh, we have formed a corporation called the Lawton Church of God. Uh, we have certain people that are officers of that corporation. Uh, we have people that come uh, and worship. And we have people that teach classes and so forth like that. Okay, those are all just things that are part of the church, but it's still Jesus that owns it all. Jesus owns you and me. Jesus is the one who calls the ministers and the teachers to their jobs. It's Jesus that actually made it possible for us to get this church building. It was a miracle because uh, we did not own this. And... Uh, we appreciate what he did to make it possible for us to have this building. Two, the foundation which the church is built on is sure. And what is that foundation? 
Well, it's not a corporation. It's not a board of directors. It's not the minister, the teachers. The foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And where people gather together on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, there you have the church. So anywhere where people today are on, built on the Lord Jesus Christ, have that exp experience of salvation, they are one with us in being the church. Okay? Now it would be nice if we could all be together in one church building. That would be a real encouragement to us. And that would be a real witness to this community about the kingdom of God. The fact that we have so many churches all divided up, going different ways, doing different things, kind of confuses the people in the city as what's the church about? And that's not what Jesus built. So uh, he is the foundation and we need to let it be like that. And then number three, he said the fact the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. No matter what battles the church faces, no matter what disappointments there have been, discouragements, no matter what kind of failures people have had as far as trying to be the church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church that Jesus built. Why? Well, because of the next point. This church is purchased by the blood of Christ. And salvation is required for membership. And God takes in the members. Okay? So, you know, if somebody comes here and says, I'd like to join your church, say, well, you can't join our church because we don't have a church for you to join. <laughs> but if you want to be part of the church that Jesus built, you have to be safe from sin. Have you been safe from sin? Well, yes, I have. Well, thank God you are a member of the church Jesus built, and you are also a member of us. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? You know, I've been to churches where, uh, well, to, to join their church, you have to stand up in front of the congregation, and they have to vote you in. That happened to me one time. And, you know, they say, okay, I will accept you as a member of the church. Yeah, they did. And when I learned the scripture later on, I had to ask of them to cancel my membership. And I'm, I talked to the pastor. He says, well, you know, we just can't do that. He says, but my being a member of your organization is unscriptural because I'm already a member of the body of Christ. He said, well, just write a letter telling the church that you, you know, want to drop your membership and, you know, we'll read it and see what the congregation says about it. Well, I never went back. So I don't know if they actually dropped my membership or not. But at least I told them I didn't want to be a member of that particular church. Not that I had anything against the people. They are very good, nice people there. It's just that it was a matter of obeying the word of God or not. So... It was the experience of salvation already made me a member of the body of Christ. I didn't have to be voted into some other group organization, totally unscriptural. Now, back to page three, looking at uh, Acts chapter two, verse four, seeing where the church has been promised, where the Beginnings of it takes place through the preaching of the kingdom. In Acts 2 and 4, we are now looking at the day of Pentecost, and we see the church completed, or the church actually being built here. And that verse says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There's more in that uh, passage than just what's said there. But the day of Pentecost, which is coming up shortly, uh, in fact, I think it's next Sunday, is actually the, the birthday of the church. Uh, you see, 
uh, with the coming of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ, he came to make salvation possible. Okay? But the church did not really come into existence until the day of Pentecost because by then Jesus had gone to heaven and then sent the Holy Spirit. And it took out took the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to build the church. The coming of the Holy Spirit is what makes what we call Christian salvation possible. That's what makes possible the new birth that Jesus was talked about in John the third chapter because remember said Jesus said to be born again means to be born of the spirit well that's what happened here on the day of Pentecost now <clears throat> Jesus said in the first chapter of Acts that when they received the Holy Spirit that they would be endued with power to testify about him well, in verse 4, we see that when the Holy Spirit came on the people there, the, the Christians, they spoke with other tongues. Now, for clarification, this is not like our Pentecostal friends practicing speaking in unknown tongues. These were other tongues, actual languages. Because if you read in the second chapter, you find out that there were people from countries all around that area and they heard the people speaking in their own native languages so uh, the people that were there in that upper room they were doing what they were testifying like Jesus said in the first chapter they were giving witness that they had experienced what Jesus had promised as far as salvation and the thousands of people that were hearing this all heard it in their own languages and understood what was being said. This was really the birthday of the church. You have the 120 that were gathered there in the upper room. But if you read on in that chapter, as a result of what happened there and then the sermon that Peter immediately preached after this, a lot of people got saved. In fact, we're told that 3,000 people got saved. Okay? Isn't that wonderful? That was the birthday of the church. Because on the day of Pentecost, it went from zero to, I'll just use the number, 3,120. <laughs> it was more than that. That's because the Holy Spirit came on them and made salvation possible for them. So, with that, technically the church is complete and it was ready to do the work that Jesus set it out to do. And I love to read the book of Acts because it is the first history of the early church. And what do we see the early church doing in the book of Acts? Preaching the gospel. You know, they weren't content just to have some 3,000 people in the church there uh, uh, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Uh, number one, they didn't have a church building. Do you think we could get 3,000 people in this church building? I just don't think we could. Uh, could we get three people standing on the church property? Possibly you could get a crowd of 3,000 people on the property of this church building. Well, the record shows us that first of all, they would come to the temple there in Jerusalem, to the outer court, which was a large, large place where a large number of people could gather. And they would have their teaching and preaching done there. But we also know that that was not extremely practical because it takes uh, a more personal touch to really teach people and ground them in the things of God than just preaching to a big group. Um, in one sense, 
the church, as far as the visible church, is always small groups. Okay? The early church met in homes. Okay? And I promise you, all the homes in Jerusalem, there's not a single home that could hold 3,000 people. So maybe you would have 20, 30, 50 people, maybe at the most. And there would be someone that was there to teach. Originally, uh, it was the original, the original apostles would be there to help get people established like this. And then when the got, got, job got too big for them, elders were appointed to do that job. And as the church grew and went in other places, that was the model that it followed back then. So the church in the book of Acts, you see, starting to grow up in other towns. Uh, remember, uh, the Jewish religion at the time had no use for the church. And so they began to persecute the church. The first persecution of the church began in about, if I remember correctly, 35 AD. And there was one particular person that was very active in persecuting the early church. A man by the name of Saul who was from the town of Tarsus. And he would go around to the various homes where people were meeting, uh, you know, to have worship in the church. Do you remember when Peter was put in jail and the angel released him? Where did he go? He went to somebody's home where they were having church. I mean, that's recorded in the book of Acts. Well, Paul, as he was persecuting the church, would go around and he'd grab people out of these homes where they're having church, bring them before the Sanhedrin where they were accused of blasphemy and so forth like this, and then punished according to the Jewish law. Well, the persecution of the church there in Jerusalem called, caused people to move away, to get away from that. And wherever the Christians moved, they would establish congregations in their towns. And there was a town in Assyria by the name of Damascus. And by the way, Damascus still exists today. So does Jerusalem. There was a church there that met in the home of this guy by the name of Ananias. And Paul heard about this church. And he goes out there to Damascus to persecute them. But what happened to Paul on the way to Damascus? Anybody remember? A light came down on him, brighter than the sun. And a voice spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting? He didn't say the church. He said, why are you persecuting me? Because the church is the body of Christ. And Paul was converted, became a Christian right there on the spot. And we know him as the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. So as a Jew, Paul the Saul was working with the gates of hell to persecute the church. But God did not allow that to prevail. <laughs> and he converted the Apostle Paul. And Paul became one of the leading uh, missionaries in the early church. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the uh, expansion of the church north and up into Europe was through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So the church was built, established, and immediately it began to grow as the gospel of salvation from sin was being preached to people around the then known world. Now, being that there is a kingdom that is the church, there has to be some way of becoming a member of that church, being part of the kingdom of God. And John, Jesus said in John 10, verse 9, 
I am the door. Okay? There's no church body that can make you a member of the church. You know, that congregation that I told you about, when they voted me into their church, they were the door to that church in that sense. But as I had already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior years earlier, I was already in the church of Jesus Christ. Okay? I am the door is what Jesus said. And he said, by me, if any man enter it, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. In other words, welcome to my body, to my church. I have provided what you need to be able to live for me, to grow from within me, and to be productive. Uh, he uses the thought of pasture there, like the, the picture over here of the shepherd with the sheep. Uh, why, why are sheep taken out into the pasture? To eat. <laughs> and she, sheep eat a lot. Why do they need to eat? To grow and to be healthy. You know, that's the way with living things. All living things eat in some way or shape, you know. I mean, even plants eat differently than we eat, but they eat to grow, to survive. And as a Christian, you have to grow. You have to be taught the Word of God and grow in it. Uh, why? Well, there are new things you have to learn about living for God. And there are things that you have to learn that, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was wrong. I need to stop doing that. Okay? So it's very important that we be in the church spiritually but also physically, because it is physically like this, where we come together to share the Word of God, to be encouraged, to be taught. And like I said, uh, it's always better that people be in smaller groups uh, to be taught the Word of God. Why? Because it could be more personal. Because it's easier to Ask a question if you didn't understand something. You know, I have no Bible for my thinking, but you know, I'm thinking that probably the largest any physical congregation should ever be is about 200 people. Because that's about the largest number of people that can be easily handled in a congregational environment where you have some ministers to preach and teach, you have teachers to deal with them, you have classes that can be taught that are you know, small enough to be manageable and can deal with situations that people have. When you get much larger, uh, you tend to become very segmented in your congregations and why not break up into smaller congregations? Still be one, but work where it's more feasible to be working. That's my thinking on that. So, Jesus Christ is the door. Um, Notice uh, the commentator says in verse 4, I mean chapter 4, when we come repenting of our sins, confessing him in our heart as our only Lord and Savior, we enter the door and become children of God and at the same time are inducted into the church as a full-fledged member with all privileges and responsibilities. And I think it's just a beautiful way to save that. Uh, we've repented of our sins and believed in Jesus Christ and accepted him as our Lord. In that very moment, you are now in the church Jesus built. Okay? Uh, become a member in particular. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, starting at verse 13, says, For by one spirit are we baptized into one body, and we are members in particular. Okay? And he uses the word members there, not in the sense of formal members where you have a little certificate of membership, you know, that proves I joined your church, but members in the sense of members like the members of a body, okay? Uh, we are appendages that have a purpose and a use. Do you realize this little appendage has a use? 
Very important to me. <laughs> okay, uh, you get it, okay? You know, I have a little toe on my foot. And maybe there was a time when I could do that <laughs> with my little toe. <laughs> but at 72, uh, it no longer reaches up there. I can't scratch my ear with my little toe. Uh, in fact, it's hard for me to get my foot much higher than, you know, maybe the level of my knee at my age anymore. Uh, but we're members. Each one of us as saved people are important to the body of Christ, uh, to the congregation, that is the physical representation of the body of Christ. You are important. You have purpose. You have meaning. You say, I don't do anything. I just, I just come on Sundays and Wednesday and like that. You have more significance than you may realize. And don't ever forget that. Uh, I hope you're praying for the work of God. Praying for the other members in the congregation. That's very important. Okay? That's something that maybe is not seen. The little finger is seen. But you know... You have more important members in your body that you can't see. And you can't live without those members. They're very important. So maybe you are not a teacher. Maybe you are not the preacher. But you are perhaps a prayer warrior. Or maybe you are a person that invites people to church. You talk to them on phone. You send emails. You see them in the stores. Uh, you give out the, you know, the, the church business cards. Always carry some with you uh, because I, I just find it just uh, from time to time, you know, standing in a line at grocery stores on a light, a conversation will start up and it's easy to give people a card. Say, hey, you know, we're open on Sundays and that's where the church is located. And look, there's the times. And if you want to check us out first, there's the web page, there's the YouTube, there's the Facebook. Got it. Okay. So, uh, we're members in particular because we have come in through the door to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see the permanence of the church. 2 Timothy 2.19, our memory verse. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Jesus Christ is the rock. He is the foundation. He's not going anywhere. He will never fail. He's always there. As this sealed, the Lord knows them that are his. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, even as long as I've been a Christian, there's times when I do get discouraged. I say, You're the pastor. How can you be discouraged? You're not permitted to be discouraged. You believe that? Well, you be pastor for a while. Ouch. <laughs> to find out whether or not you can get discouraged. You live for God 50 or 60 years and find out if you'd be discouraged. It's possible. Hey, we're all human. Okay? God knoweth them that are his. And I have learned that sometimes the greatest, the best, strongest lessons I have ever received from God come through those times of discouragement. You know, it just seems like whenever I'm low and he reaches down and lifts me up, I learn something I did not know. I find a deeper sense of his grace that's with me. And maybe it's not something I can share with other people, but it's something that God helps me and through that help, ministers in some way to the people that God has called me to help. So God knoweth them that are, his, that are his. Does he know you? Does he know you? Then here's a big and that goes along with that. You know, people like the idea of being church members and all this. Gives them a sense of security. But there is a caveat, a requirement that is placed on our 
membership in the body of Christ on our salvation. And what is that? It says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, okay, everyone that names the name of Christ, everyone that says, I am a Christian, that's what that means, right? Name the name of Christ, I am a Christian. Do what? Depart from iniquity. You say you're a Christian. Depart from iniquity. What does that mean? Quit sinning. Don't sin. And it just boggles my mind that so many people calling themselves Christians and may be Christians don't understand that, have not grasped that. Because they're taught that in spite of being saved, you're going to sin more or less every day in word, thought, or deed. And they're taught that salvation is just basically the forgiveness of your sins. And I've even heard it taught that all your future sins are actually forgiven the moment that you accept Christ. Yeah, and I won't tell you what church was that I heard that taught in, but I didn't want to be a member of that church. And there are people that actually believe that. Well, if I'm out there and I tell a lie and I get hit by a car, well, that sin was already forgiven way back when I became a church member. So I got hit by a car, got killed, and I go immediately to heaven. Well, what about that sin that you committed, that lie that you told? Listen, you will face it. You will face it. It doesn't go away just because one time you prayed. Depart from iniquity. How can you depart from iniquity and be telling lies, be watching pornography, being covetous, dishonoring your parents, committing adultery, on and on and on and on. You cannot, you cannot be a safe person and commit iniquity. So it's important, it's imperative that if we call ourselves Christians, that we depart from iniquity. Why? The foundation of God is sure. It's permanent. And God is watching over and God is protecting the integrity of his church. Uh, top of page five, the sentence up there, the seal which God has affixed to his people is that of holiness. Holiness. Holiness is simply obeying God. Obeying God. Amen.